Well, good morning again. It is October the 22nd. Good to have you with us. We'll be reading through the Bible in a year, and so we are reading today's a section of that. We are in the book of Psalms, chapter 119, which actually is the longest chapter in the Bible. So there's that. And then we will be reading Jeremiah 14 through 16, 2 Thessalonians 2 through 3, and then Proverbs chapter 7. We have three articles. Two of them are <clears throat> regular articles. The third one is just a little clip it. Uh, uh, to you the nations will come, may it run swiftly and be glorified. And then a little snippet, a little article from Frederick Douglass. Let us begin. We're going to turn in our Bibles to the book of Psalms. And let's read the longest chapter in the Bible. Amen. Psalms chapter 119. Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies, as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may see wondrous things from your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. You rebuke the proud, the cursed who stray from your commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Princes also sit and speak against me, but your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I shall meditate on your wonderful works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies. O oh Lord, do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Teach me, O oh Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. 
give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings, and will not be ashamed. And I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. Remember the word to your servant, upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. The proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I remembered your judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. This has become mine because I kept your precepts. You are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep your words. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your word. I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have bound me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. I am a companion of all who fear you and those who keep your precepts. The earth, O oh Lord, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. You have dealt well with your servant, O oh Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in your word. I know, O oh Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let, I pray, your merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to your word, to your servant. Let your tender mercies come to me, that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they treated me wrongfully with falsehood. But I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. Let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes, that I may not be ashamed. My soul faints for your salvation, 
but I hope in your word. My eyes fail from searching your word, saying, When will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in smoke, yet I do not forget your statutes. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? The proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. All your commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help me. They almost made an end of me on earth, but I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness, so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth, and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances, for all are your servants. Unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours. Save me. For I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me, but I will consider your testimonies. I have seen the consummation of all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, I pray, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord and teach me your judgments. My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, to the very end. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your word, that I may live, and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Hold me up, and I shall be safe, and I shall observe your statutes continually. You reject all those who stray from your statutes, for their deceit is falsehood. You put away all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the proud oppress me. My eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. Deal with your servant according to your mercy and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. 
Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. Therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. I hate every false way. Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The entrance of your words gives light, gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I long for your commandments. Look upon me and be merciful to me, as your custom is toward those who love your name. Direct my steps by your word, and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. Rivers of water run down from my eyes, because men do not keep your law. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies which you have commanded are righteous and very faithful. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. I cry out with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I cry out to you. Save me. And I will keep your testimonies. I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. My eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. O oh Lord, Revive me according to your justice. They draw near who follow after wickedness. They are far in your law. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. Consider my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. Many are my persecutors and my enemies, yet I do not turn from your testimonies. I see the treacherous and am disgusted because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Lord, I hope for your salvation, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. 
I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand become my help, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you, and let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. And that is Psalms 119. Amen. We are going to turn in our Bibles now <clears throat> to our next set of verses found in Jeremiah. And so we are going to turn here to Jeremiah. And starting at chapter 14, we are going to look at 14, 15, and 16. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the droughts. Judah mourns, and her gates languish. They mourn for the land, and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. Their nobles have sent their lads for water. They went to the cisterns and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads, because the ground is parched, for there was no rain in the land. The plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. Yes, the deer also gave birth in the field, but left because there was no grass. And the wild donkeys stood in the desolate heights. They sniffed at the wind like jackals. Their eyes <clears throat> failed because there was no grass. O oh Lord, Though our iniquities testify against us, do it for your name's sake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. Oh, the hope of Israel, his Savior, in time of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land and like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? Why should you be like a man astonished, like a mighty one who cannot save? Yet you, O oh Lord, are in our midst, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. Thus says the Lord to this people. Thus they have loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now and punish their sins. Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry, and when they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, whom I did not send, and who say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine those prophets shall be consumed, 
and the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. They will have no one to bury them, them nor their wives, their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness on them. Therefore, you shall say this word to them. Let my eyes flow with tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people has been broken with a mighty stroke, with a very severe blow. If I go out to the field, then behold those slain with the sword. And if I enter the city, then behold those sick from famine. Yes, both prophet and priest go about in a land they do not know. Have you utterly rejected Judah? Has your soul loathed Zion? Why have you stricken us so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace, but there was no good, and for the time of healing, and there was trouble. We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Do not abhor us for your name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember, do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the idols of the nations that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, O Lord our God? <clears throat> Therefore we will wait for you, since you have made all these. And now Jeremiah chapter 15. Then the Lord said to me, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward this people. Cast them out of my sight, and let them go forth. And it shall be, if they say to you, Where should we go? Then you shall tell them, Thus says the Lord, Such as are for death, to death, and such as are for the sword, to the sword, and such as are for the famine, to the famine, and such as are for the captivity, to the captivity. And I will appoint over them four forms of destruction, the sword to slay, the dogs to drag, the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. I will hand them over to trouble to all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. For who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem? Or who will bemoan you? Or who will turn aside to ask how you are doing? You have forsaken me. You have gone backward. Therefore I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am weary of relenting and I will winnow them with a winnowing fan in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people since they do not return from their ways. Their widows will be increased to me more than the sand of the seas. I will bring against them, against the mother of the young men, a plunderer at noonday. I will cause anguish and terror to fall on them suddenly. She languishes who has borne seven. She has breathed her last. Her son has gone down while it was yet day. She has been ashamed and confounded, and the remnant of them I will deliver to the sword before their enemies, says the Lord. Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest, nor have men lent to me for interest. Every one of them curses me. The Lord said, Surely it will be well with your remnant. Surely I will cause the enemy to intercede with you in the time of adversity and in the time of affliction. 
Can anyone break iron, the northern iron and the bronze? Your wealth and your treasures I will give as plunder without price because of all your sins throughout your territories. And I will make you cross over with your enemies into a land which you do not know. For a fire is kindled in my anger, which shall burn upon you. O oh Lord, you know. Remember me and visit me, and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your enduring patience, do not take me away. Know that for your sake, I have suffered rebuke. Your words were found and I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name. O oh Lord God of hosts, I did not sit in the assembly of the mockers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because of your hand, for you have filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? Will you surely be to me like an unreliable stream as waters that fail? Thus says the Lord, If you return, then I will bring you back. You shall stand before me. If you take out the precious from the vial, you shall be as my mouth. Let them return to you, but you must not return to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified bronze wall, and they will fight against you but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you. I will deliver you from the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem you from the grip of the terror. And now chapter number 16. The word of the Lord also came to me, saying, You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place, and concerning their mothers who bore them, and their fathers who begot them in this land. They shall die gruesome deaths. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried. But they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. For thus says the Lord, Do not enter the house of mourning, nor go to lament or bemoan them, for I have taken away my peace from this people, says the Lord, loving kindness and mercies. Both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, Neither shall men lament for them, cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them. Nor shall men break bread in mourning for them, to comfort them for the dead. Nor shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or their mother. Also you shall not go into the house of feasting to sit with them, to eat and drink. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold. I will cause to cease from this place before your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. And it shall be when you show this people all these words and they say to you, Why has the Lord pronounced all this great disaster against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then you shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, says the Lord. They have walked after other gods, and have served them, and worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and not kept my law. And you have done worse than your fathers. For behold, each one follows the dictates of his own evil heart, so that no one listens to me. Therefore, 
I will cast you out of this land, into a land that you do not know, neither you nor your fathers. And there you shall serve other gods day and night, where I will not show you favor. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, that it shall no more be said, The Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back into their land, which I gave to their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. And first I will repay double for their iniquity and their sin, because they have defiled my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable idols. O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness, and unprofitable things. Will a man make gods for himself which are not gods? Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. And that is the reading out of Jeremiah for today, chapters 14 through 16. Now we are going to turn to the New Testament, and we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians. And uh, some of these books are fairly small, so when we are reading a chapter at a time, it does not take very long to go through these books. Uh, we will be reading chapters 2 and 3 today. And here is chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And now chapter number three. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified, just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. <clears throat> Amen. And it doesn't take very long to go through 2 Thessalonians when there are only three chapters in that book. So we have completed that. Now we have actually several stories uh, that, uh, that the founders, uh, these verses in 2 Thessalonians meant a lot to the founders. And so we have several readings that will come uh, from this book. Uh, some of the readings we will read today, there are so many, and then some of these readings uh, we will read tomorrow uh, because they are quite lengthy, but they are oh so good, so you don't want to pass them up. We are going to go back now to the book of Proverbs, like we always do, and we will uh, read Proverbs chapter 7. So let's make our way back to Proverbs and chapter number 7. <clears throat> my son, keep my words, and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. For at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice and saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding, 
passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him. With an impudent face, she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today, I have paid my vows. So I came out to meet you, diligently to seek your face, and I have found you. I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till an arrow struck his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost his life. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. <clears throat> that is the reading for today. Psalms 119, Jeremiah 14 through 16, Second Thessalonians. We finished up that book today, chapters 2 and 3, and Proverbs chapter 7. Now we've got a couple of readings. Uh, to you the nations will come. And this is out of Jeremiah. <clears throat> then we have, may it run swiftly and be glorified. And I believe that that is out of Second Thessalonians. Yes. So let's start with, to you the nations will come. <clears throat> From the beginning, America was a haven for people uh, from all over the world who wanted to enjoy civil and religious liberties. And significantly, the Founding Fathers understood that these two types of liberty were intimately co-joined. As affirmed by declaration signer John Witherspoon, and I quote, There is not a single instance in history in which civil liberty was lost and religious liberty preserved entire. God grant that in America true religion and civil liberty may be inseparable and that the unjust attempts to destroy the one may in the issue tend to the support and establishment of both. Jedediah Morsi agreed. He was a leading educator from the founding era who was active on the political scene throughout the revolution and held government positions afterward. He reminded citizens, to the kindly influence of Christianity, we owe that degree of civil freedom and political and social happiness which mankind now enjoy. In proportion, as the genuine effects of Christianity are diminished in any nation, in the same proportion, 
will the people of that nation recede from the blessings of genuine freedom and approximate the miseries of complete despotism? I hold this to be a truth confirmed by experience. If so, it follows that all efforts made to destroy the foundations of our holy religion ultimately tend to the subversion also of our political freedom and happiness. Whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present republican forms of government and all the blessings which flow from them must fall with them. Citizens from across the world came to America to enjoy its unprecedented liberties and bountiful blessings. Significantly, the Bible records numerous instances of people from various nations and races traveling to where they could come together to enjoy the blessings of the Lord. Psalms 86, 9, Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, Acts 17, 26, and Revelation 7, 9 and 10. The American Revolution was a perfect picture of this type of assemblage. Consider, for example, Prince Whipple who had been a slave at the start of the revolution, but was freed by his master, Declaration Signer William Whipple. Prince accompanied General George Washington in the legendary Christmas Day crossing of the Delaware. He is believed to be the man on the oar in the front of Washington's boat, in the famous painting of the crossing of the Delaware. After participating in the Battle of Trenton, he also fought in the battles of Saratoga in 1777 and Rhode Island in 1778. Prince directly attended General Washington and the general staff throughout the revolution serving as a soldier and aide at the highest levels. Prince, who joined with others of all nationalities to fight America's civil and religious liberties, is representative of thousands of similar black patriots who did the same, including Wentworth Cheswell, Elected to office in New Hampshire in 1768, he made a Paul Revere-like ride to rouse patriots. Salem Poor, a soldier in the battles of Bunker Hill, Saratoga, and Monmouth, he entered the devastating winter at Valley Forge. Peter Salmon, a decorated hero at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Prince Estabrook, a black Minuteman wounded at Lexington. James Armistead, America's first double spy, as well as notice, notable Richard Allen, Lemuel Haynes, Jordan Freeman, Prince Sisson, Oliver Cromwell, and countless others. But it was not just blacks and whites who joined together in the American Revolution. Also included were Hispanics, such as Juan Morales, Baronero de Gavalis, and Francisco Saavedra, Irish, such as General Richard Montgomery and Commodore John Barry. In fact, 
twenty of George Washington's generals were of Irish descent. Frenchmen, such as General Lafayette and Admiral de Grecy. Poles, such as Count Pulaski and General Thaddeus Kazusko. Germans, such as Generals de Kalb and von Studen, and many Indian tribes, including the Stockbridge, Passamatoqui, St. John's, Penobscot, Anasdes, and Tuscaceros. And it was not just men, but also women, such as Captain Margaret Corbin. When her husband was wounded, she took over his cannon and fired with deadly accuracy. Seriously wounded, she was granted a lifetime military stability by the Continental Congress. Deborah Sampson, posing as a man, she entered and served in the Continental Armor. Abigail Adams, the source of accurate military intelligence for her husband, John, and the Continental Congress. Elizabeth Lewis, wife of Declaration signer Francis Lewis, she was made a prisoner of war for personally withstanding the British attempt to wreck their house and plunder their property. Sybil Luddington. She made an all-night Paul Revere-like ride of 40 miles through New York, calling patriots to arms against a British attack. Mercy Otis Warren, America's first female historian, called the conscientious of the revolution. Mary Ludwig Hayes, when her husband was shot, she took his place in the artillery corps and was awarded a military pension by the Pennsylvania legislature. Lydia Dora. She saved countless American troops from a surprise attack when encamped at Valley Forge. Mary Catherine Goodard, a newspaper woman, printer, editor, and publisher. She issued the first printed copy of the De Declaration of Independence to include the names of the signers, and throughout the Revolution she served as postmaster of Baltimore. Anna Strong, part of the spy ring of George Washington's chief intelligence officer, Major Benjamin Talmig and many others who contributed greatly to independence. Furthermore, it was not just Christians, but also Jews, including Haman Solomon, who helped secure the financing for George Washington to continue the revolution. Isaac Moses, a blockade runner carrying supplies to American troops. Major Benjamin Nunns, a leader in the battles of Savannah and Camden. Mordecai Sheftal, a patriot leader in Georgia. Francis Salvador, the first Jewish patriot to die in the Revolution. Colonels David and Isaac Franks, military as well as synagogue leaders, and many others. In short, the revolution, the Americans were composed of black, white, red, brown, both men and women, Christian and Jew, 
English, Polish, Irish, French, Scottish, German, and others. But every one of them committed to securing civil and religious liberty, self-government, and the enjoyment of their unalienable rights. Decades later, John Adams remembered a time when, addressing a group of Americans, he recalling, Who composed that army of fine young fellows that was then before my eyes? There were among them Roman Catholics, English Episcopalians, Scottish and American Presbyterians, Methodists, Moravians, Anabaptists, German Lutherans, German Calvinists, Universalists, Arians, Presbyterians, Sconians, Independents, Congregationalists, Horse Patriotists, uh, Protestants, and House Protestants, I'm sorry, Horse Protestants, and House Protestants, Deists, and Atheists, and Protestants, qui ni quib rin. Very few, however, of several of these species, nevertheless, all educated in the general principles of Christianity. The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. Now, I will avow that I then believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. Adam saw the great diversity before him, but recognized that they had all come together in this land to partake of its Christian principles and to enjoy God's blessings. Early America certainly reflected the description in Jeremiah 16 and verse 19. O Lord, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge in the day of distress, to you the nations will come from the ends of the earth. Wow. The foundation of Christianity. And now we go to the next article, May It Run Swiftly and Be Glorified. And this is found through Second Thessalonians and chapter 3. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul closes his second letter to the church in Thessalonica, Greece, by requesting of them, Brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse number 1. God's word had changed the people in Thessalonica, and it would do the same for others who heard it. Paul, therefore, wanted to see a knowledge of and veneration for God's word spread everywhere across the world. Eighteen hundred years later, Americans also wanted to see the word of the Lord run swiftly 
and be glorified. The first American organization dedicated solely and completely to this objective, to spreading God's word across the entire United States, was the Bible Society of Philadelphia. Instrumental in starting that group was declaration signer Benjamin Rush, and cooperating with him in that mission were Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Lutherans, German Calvinists, Methodists, Baptists, Moravians, and others. Despite their wide diversity in belief and worship, they were all able to cooperate together because of their common love for the Bible. As Dr. Rush explained, they all realized the inestimable value of the revelation which it hath pleased God to make to our world of his existence, character, will, works, and grace in Jesus Christ in the Bible, and of the great benefits to be expected from the distribution of it among persons who are unable or not disposed to purchase it. Another of the Society's founders, Dr. William White, a chaplain of Congress and the primary founder of the Episcopal Church in America, he agreed as to the cause of the unprecedented cooperation, affirming, The Bible Society is manifestly a design in which all denominations of Christians, without exception, may unite. They all profess to derive their decrees and sentiments from the sacred writings. They all profess to believe that those writings contain the fountain of life, which, of course, they are equally bound to open to those who may be perishing under malades which nothing else can relieve. The society aggressively pursues its mission of placing Bibles without cost into the hands of those who had none, and by the close of their first year, happily reported that some hundreds of families are now in possession of a Bible, which never had one before. Other parts of the country seeing what the Philadelphia Society had done, quickly started similar organizations in their own areas, including in Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and South Carolina, within only eight years, an amazing 121 Bible societies had been started across America for the purpose of distributing God's Word. Many were started by founding fathers who had created America's governing documents such as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. The leaders of the Philadelphia Bible Society, elated at the national growth, extolled. Were it possible that Bible societies, these lights which God has kindled in the firmament of his church, should immediately disappear, the knowledge they have already imparted, and the blessings they have been instrumental in conveying must live for generations to come. But these societies are not about to expire. Their numbers, their labors, their usefulness 
are daily increasing. The word of the Lord runs and is glorified. America's Bible societies were one means by which Paul's desire that the word of the Lord run swiftly and be glorified was fulfilled. Praise God. And that is the end of that particular article. And we have a very short little brief statement made by Frederick Douglass. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 15, stand firm and hold to the traditions. In the words of his 1852 speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July? The great social reformer and orator Frederick Douglass declared, the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by those principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cost. And that is the readings for today. Our verses and our readings, we discover the Word of God. We discover the beliefs of the Founding Fathers and how our nation was brought together under the foundation of the Word of God. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will see you again tomorrow.